ago, John Phillips. Now this is what you need to understand about coders. Coders are very, 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 very focused people. Very focused. John Phillips is typical of that intensity that you see with people, electronic engineers, software engineers, who really know what they're doing, who are really in there, in the zone. And it's an important thing that, that other people don't seem to realise. I think the reason I, I, I sort of see it is because this scientific background, which I was a bit of a failure at, to be truthful, this scientific background gave me an appreciation and in, and in fact when I was at the museum from 73 to 79 I worked on computing there, we had a computer at the museum, it was like a new toy uh, and I was allowed to have a play with it and I wrote co code in Algol and in Fortran 4 Hands up those people have written in Fortran 4? What a crap language, what a dreadful language Oh, looking back well, I'm getting applause for that, I'm not quite sure what, what, why, I think it's because it's a crap language. It is a crap language, isn't it? Hard work. So, um, but when you've written code yourself, as I, uh, and you know, even in Fortran 4, and you realise just how difficult it is, you realise why it is you get people like John Phillips who are so intense and so concentrated at it. John, John Phillips, we got to know him through Impossible, and of course, the game which everybody uh, remembers is Nebulous, which is down the bottom, down the bottom here. There's a story about Nebulous, which we released, we released it in 1987, and the real, and it's a, an example of how the competitiveness, which I think, uh, in the bedroom to billions uh, film uh, at lunchtime, there was, I think it was Ben Dadish who was talking about how people were competitive how programmers learned from one another, saw what one another did. And this is a good example with Nebulous here, because in the loading screen for Iridium on the C64, there's a wonderful little rainbow effect on the loading screen, where Andrew is toggling the colours illegally during the frame, frame flyback uh, of the electron beam on the screen. Am I making any sense? Yeah, I'm seeing a few nodding. The, the electron beam writes the screen, and then is switched, uh, switched off as it flies back. And that gives you a period of time as a programmer where you could do something. And Andrew was uh, fiddling the colours on the C64 to produce this rainbow effect, which, if you look at the Uridium's loading screen, uh, opening screen, is very clear. And of course, John Phillips saw that and thought, how's he doing that? Fiddle around a bit and produce this cylinder on the screen, on the C64, uh, written, uh, written with um, the character set, by toggling the character set with a sine wave running over it. And he showed that to me, and I looked at it and I thought, yeah, very good. Mm. What can we do with that? And he went away again, and next time I saw him, I went down to see him, he lived in Cornwall. Um, I went down to see him, and by then he'd taken that cylinder and turned it vertically. He got it running like this, so it was rotating like this. And he put one or two graphics, one or two sprites over the top of it, just to show that he could. And he had a rotating thing. And I said to him, right, okay, what we're we, what we going to do with this looks good, what we're we going to do with it? And he was thinking about some kind of battle game, you know, this was battlements, this might be a castle, and so on. And I was, and apart from the fact he'd been inspired by Iridium, I was also very hooked on the, the balance of Iridium and how simple it was and how, how you could get a great game from do, doing something simple very well. And so I looked at this rotating uh, thing and, and I said, well, I think that's a tower, isn't it? Why don't we call that a tower? Forget, you know, think about joining this up, why don't we just call that one tower? And what do you do with a tower? Every tower that, that anybody ever goes up to, like when they're on holiday, they think, I'm going to climb that, or maybe they don't. When you get to my age, you think, you climb it. But actually, everyone else has said, I'm going to climb that. So I said to John, can you have gravity? And he sort of went, there's not enough, there's not much time, you know, left in the, in the game loop, because there's an awful lot of this, of the processing power is doing this. Okay, um, can you have some sort of gravity? I don't care if it's accurate, just can you make stuff go down? Yeah, I'll right, do that. So, so, of course, there was the idea. Right, okay, 
platform game, gravity, climb up the tower. When you get to the end at the top of the tower, that's it. You've finished the level. How do you know you've finished the level? You're at the top of the tower. It's not difficult, is it? So that's the story behind Nebulous. Really how, uh, and that's, uh, I think that it really encapsulates for me as, as the story. It's got all the elements. It's got the competitiveness of John Phillips seeing what Andrew was doing and thinking, oh, oh I'll have a look at that. It's got the, the uh, idea of the tech, not the producing this effect that nobody had seen before, because by the way, that was the key with Nebulous. It was nobody's ever seen this before. And then banging that into a game that, that people could play. And as a result, uh, you probably know. I mean, ne Nebulous is a great award winner for us all over, all over the shop. It won all sorts of awards. And I haven't really seen a rotating platform game uh, since then. There have been one or two that have been a, a bit close, and we, it, 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 this was ported to um, the Nintendo, uh, of course. And the real key, of, of course, is you, for me, is you need to be that kind of intense programmer that John is, was, and probably still is, I'm not sure everyone knows, uh, kind of intense programmer to, to, to produce that kind of work. That's how it was. So, I spent a long time uh, talking about, about that because that's really the key for me about being a video game pioneer. That's what you really needed to be, uh, to be like. And you saw it again on the Bedroom to Billions video uh, at lunchtime when uh, Matthew Smith was talking about um, Manic Miner uh, and talking about how he built, built this interface from his TRS-80 to uh, the, uh, the ZX Spectrum. He built it himself and, and, and how he worked out to do what he did. But also, he talked a bit, did anyone notice him talking about double buffering? Double buffering, anyone? Double buffering, double buffering. He talked to it, he did, didn't he? And I thought, I haven't heard anyone talking about double bucket buffering for the best part of 30 years. But that's the kind of technical level that you have to operate at. So, I'm coming to the end of the talk now. I think there's one more slide. And you really ask, why were we successful? The truth is, I had the motive means of opportunity. I had the motive, I wanted to make some money. Uh, I was a bit miserable in my job. Uh, and the opportunity of the ZX80 came up. I'm not sure whether everybody else was miserable and a bit fed up in their job like I was, but that's how I was. As it happens, uh, my, the thing I think that was quite distinctive at the time was that I was one of the, I was one of the few people that sat in that gap. Not good enough to be a, a coder, not really all that interested in uh, all the business side of license times and uh, I can't be bothered with any of that. I was much more interested in what the people were doing. And as it says here, I don't have patience, patience to write code all day. So, the next slide says, yes, it says the same thing. What's the next one? Yes, that's the key. That for me is the key. I think there's a, there's a, a life lesson here, a, life, a lesson for humanity, if you like. I'm going to say to you that all creativity comes from technological developments. All of it. That's what certainly happened in the games business in the 1980s. We suddenly had these platforms and it suddenly gave a great burst of creativity. We saw it in the music industry <laughs> previous to that in the 1960s. Um, when, I, you know, when I was young, electronic guitars, synthesizers, they were invented in the 1960s and we had this wonderful burst of creativity and there are people uh, who um, play uh, tracks from the 60s and 70s even today aren't there and that's the reason why, it's because there was the technological platform, there was the, the technical platform and then we get this uh, burst of creativity and I think you see that once you understand that that's how uh, we human beings are, we're interested in novelty, uh, and then Steve Jobs comes out with his phones, and he just stands on the stage and he goes, flicks with his thing, flick, and we all go, oh, I want one. And there, there, 
but you think about how he managed to do that. There's a lot of technology just going on in sensing your finger. How's that done, by the way? Does anybody know? It's capacitance through the glass. It's a very, very special glass. Another fine example of how the creativity comes from the technological development. And that's what I believed in, uh, in the 1980s, and that's what I still believe today. And that is probably my key lesson for video game pioneers. Thank you very much.